Thanks, Anna. And thank you so much for all of your efforts, Anna, in organizing these seminars and symposia. I think it's one of the nice benefits of our virtual world um, to and, and share with the community some updates. So um, today I'm going to talk about illuminating orphan GPCRs in lymphatic vasculature. So two unknowns, orphan GPCRs and lymphatics. So first, let me just give a little bit of a primer on the lymphatic vascular system. The lymphatic vascular system is a parallel and separate vascular system from the blood uh, arteries and veins, although they, they parallel each other within the body. And they have the principal function of draining interstitial fluid. And in doing so, they maintain fluid homeostasis in our organs and in the periphery. The lymphatic vessels are connected to, let me get my laser pointer here, um, they are connected to lymph nodes, as, as you might be aware, and in that capacity, they play a really critical role in trafficking of immune cells, and they're also really important for the dissemination of metastatic cancer cells. And also within the intestine, the lymphatics are the major route of absorption for lipids. And so collectively, there's these diverse roles of the lymphatic vascular system uh, and, and multiple roles, very different than the blood vascular system whose principal function is to deliver oxygen and, and remove wastes. And lymphatic vessels are able to accomplish these diverse roles by having highly specialized and permeable barriers in comparison to the blood endothelial cells. And these oak leaf overlapping junctions permit large molecules and cells to enter the dermal capillaries. And then through parasaltic contraction of larger collecting vessels, um, they're able to pull and drain fluid um, from the periphery back into um, the central uh, blood circulation through the thoracic duct. Now, in an adult, that's about 120 milliliters of uh, fluid per hour, and this fluid is called lymph, and that equates to two to three liters per day. So the lymphatics are really critical, and you can envision that if there are deficits in lymphatic function, you very quickly um, develop lymphedema. There are different types of lymphedema, primary or congenital forms of lymphedema, which are rare, uh, rare conditions uh, affecting 10,000 to 100,000 individuals um, in the United States. But by far much more common is secondary lymphedema. And secondary lymphedema results from surgical lymph node removal or radiation therapy, which again uh, is, has shown to be life-saving, um, especially for women with breast cancer and breast cancer survivors who will have their lymph nodes removed. But one such patient is shown here after removal of her lymph node, the return of the lymphatic uh, fluid in the affected arm is severed. And so the fluid builds up within, within the affected arm. Parasitic filarial lymphedema is a worldwide problem and affects 120 million people. Um, and it is uh, the cause of um, filarial um, parasites that like to live within the lymphatic capillaries and actually present a physical obstruction to the flow of lymph. Now, remarkably, we have no um, pharmacological therapies or targets for lymphedema or lymphatic vessels. And so the only, um, the only uh, treatment for lymphedema is the daily wearing of low compression garments, which you can see in this figure, and as well as massage. And so you'll see lymphatic clinics popping up all over the country where deep tissue massage is used to actually physically push the fluid back into these lymphatic vessels and try and alleviate this lymphedema. Now, as the field has progressed over the years, we've been able to identify new markers for lymphatic vessels. And this has enabled researchers to look at the function and roles of physiological roles of lymphatics in different tissues. And I highlight some of these key findings here. I mentioned in the intestine, the um, lacteals within the small intestine are each invested with a lymphatic vessel. You can see it here in green in these finger-like um, intestinal lacteals. And they're responsible responsible for absorbing lipid. And if they are dysfunctional, patients can suffer from lymphangiectasia and protein-losing enteropathy, which are clinical terms uh, observed in individuals who, despite a normal diet, fail to thrive. Within the heart, we're recognizing more and more how critical cardiac lymphatics are for preserving the heart um, following 
heart failure, or in conditions of myocardial edema, a protective and beneficial um, vascular system to keep the myocardium uh, not uh, with edema uh, so that the myocytes can, can continue to contract normally. Within the eye, Schlem's canal and the trabecular meshwork are lymph-like structures that are really important for controlling the fluid within the anterior chamber um, and preventing glaucoma. Very exciting studies, um, and there's a, a series of them, identifying or re-identifying meningeal lymphatics within uh, the, the meninges of the CNS and playing really critical roles in draining uh, CSF fluid and also cleansing the brain while we sleep and getting rid of these um, deleterious proteins, including beta amyloid during uh, in Alzheimer's patients. So again, there are very few therapeutic GPCRs that target lymphatics. And here I've pulled some data from the, TINEC, the IDG available TINEX database searching for lymphedema. VEGF R3, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase, is well known to be a great target for lymphatic uh, vessels. But there are only two G protein coupled identi GPCRs identified at the time of, of doing this search. CLSSR1 is uh, based on one publication, and CalCARL is a receptor that's very dear to, to my heart. We've been studying this for nearly 20 years now because a deletion of CLR, the receptor, RAMP2, its activity modifying protein, or its ligand adrenomedulin results in embryonic lethality in mice. And you can see on the left-hand side, this fluid-filled embryo um, that has this hydrops fatalis phenotype. And this is due to arrested development of lymphatic vessels during embryogenesis. And more recently, in, in recent years, we've also identified a large family pedigree in which a, an in-frame deletion of valine 205 within the ECL2 domain of the CLR receptor is associated with a lack of association with the accessory protein and non-immune hydrops fatalis in two of these infants um, in, in this family. And so we have conservation of a role for this receptor, both in mouse and humans, but clearly a of uh, GPCR targets to, to look at lymphatic vessels. And so we have leveraged a variety of different approaches focused on lymphatic endothelial cells to try and identify orphan receptors that, that could be future therapeutic targets for lymphatics. And one of the ways we did this was the old fashioned G protein coupled receptor expression array, comparing, comparing relative levels of expression between lymphatic endothelial cells and blood endothelial cells. And then we coupled this data with FairSeq or the open chromatin landscape of lymphatic endothelial cells and also ribotagging of single cells, or I'm sorry, ribotagging of uh, not single cells, but bulk cells isolated from uh, tissues. And I'll show you how this data has come together to identify some key targets. And the targets that I'll talk about today are GPRC5B and GPR116. Our, um, at the time of writing our RO3 proposal, Frizzled 8 was still classified as an orphan, but we now recognize it as a, a Wnt Frizzled family member. And GPR61 was also an orphan receptor identified as the enriched uh, GPCRs within lymphatic endothelium. I found it interesting that at the top of these lists are in fact um, orphan receptors and, and I often wonder if perhaps that's a, a consequence of the fact that lymphatic endothelial cells in general are also understudied. So it may be a, a nice opportunity or, or a, a serendipity that at the top of the lists are these orphan receptors. So to first ask whether or not uh, these receptors are expressed in lymphatic endothelial cells, we turn to the mouse and we turn to development because this is a stage in development where we can define lymphatic endothelial cells using some well-established markers and also the stereotypic development um, and positioning of lymphatic vessels within a mouse embryo. And we couple this with um, RNA scope which um, will go and identify at a single mRNA uh, 
target um, and fluorescently label a, a single mRNA molecule within cells. And we do this through cross sections of the thoracic area where the carotid artery and the jugular, uh, the jugular vein are juxtaposed right next to the jugular lymph sac, which is emanated from the jugular vein. And so you can see in these cross sections and perhaps even better in the zoomed in image of GPRC5B that these uh, magenta puncta are indicative and are present at high levels in lymphatic endothelial cells that are stained with LIV1, the lymphatic marker. And this data is quantitated here in the graph on the right. GPR116 was also expressed fairly well in uh, developing lymphatic endothelial cells. And you can see in the bottom here that there were puncta in these green uh, jugular lymph sacs. However, GPR61 was expressed at pretty low levels as well as frizzled eight. We, were, we occasionally saw a puncta here or there, but really not robust expression. So um, next we wanted to ask uh, whether or not this expression for these receptors was conserved throughout development and into adult tissues. And to do that, we turn to a different methodology, which is ribotagging. So using Cree-based techniques where we can specifically express this ribotagging um, uh, reporter uh, within lymphatic endothelial cells, we can, uh, in different tissues, as exemplified in these cartoons, we can pull out HA-tagged tra actively translating um, mRNAs. And in such a way, uh, after following RNA-seq, have a list of the top enriched actively translating mRNAs within lymphatic endothelial cells in different tissues. And when we do this, you can see that LIV1, the reporter, is highly enriched, and, and these are the uh, log2 values, highly enriched in lymphatic endothelial cells of these different organs. Our positive control, CalcRL, the, the receptor that I, I mentioned, is also highly enriched in the heart, lung, and meninges, and this is very consistent with the phenotypes that we know from our mouse models. So now looking at the orphan receptors, GPR116, remember by RNA scope, it was expressed rather low in development, but it was gratifying to see that in adulthood, in adult tissues, there's very high expression, even higher than CLR um, in the heart and the lung. And so this would suggest that future studies looking at the role of this receptor in adult tissues would really be warranted. For GPRC5B, remember from the RNA scope, it was very high in development in the tissues uh, of the embryo, but this data says that it's actually low in adulthood. So very negligible expression in lymphatic endothelial cells um, in the adult tissue. And again, GPR61 uh, lowly expressed both in development and adulthood. So uh, we have now focused our attention then on GPR116 in adult tissues and GPRC5B in both development and adult tissues. So um, just on Friday, this past Friday, uh, adult reporter mice for GPR116 um, generously provided to us by Brian Ross Lab have made the harrowing journey um, from the genetic medicine building to across campus to the neuroscience center and are now in our colony. And so we're really looking forward to following up and looking in adult tissues for the expression of GPR116 in uh, lymphatic endothelial cells. And again, that just happened last week. So thanks to Brian and his lab for providing us with this really valuable resource. Now, for looking at uh, screening for the uh, requirement or the, the essential nature of a, of a gene or a protein in lymphatic development, we can turn to model organisms because they provide a very fast and high throughput way or <laughs> medium throughput way of identifying the, the requisite um, uh, requirement for genes in lymphatic development. And in zebrafish, the um, thoracic duct develops very stereotypically within the tail and it emanates from the posterior cardinal vein and lives right under the dorsal aorta. And you can see that here in this green uh, label, which is this major thoracic vessel. And if we couple that with morpholino knockdown for GPRC5B, we can immediately appreciate in, in a pretty short order that the expression of this receptor is absolutely critical for lymphatic development in fish. And so in the control animals, you'll see uh, right under the dorsal aorta and above the posterior cardinal vein, this green labeled thoracic duct, 
which is essentially absent in Morpholino knockdown of GPRC5b, and this data is quantitated here. So this data tells us that the expression of this receptor, even in fish, is really critical for the, the development of, of these vessels. So in collaboration with Dr. Brad St. Croix at NIH, their lab had developed GPRC5b null mice and so we were really excited and, and grateful to receive these mice from this lab and characterize their developmental phenotypes. And the wild type animals are shown on the left and on the right are a variety of different phenotypes or a penetration of phenotypes for GPRC5B null animals. And I hope you can appreciate like that prior uh, image that I showed you of the CLR knockout mice, this hydrops fatalis or this edema, interstitial edema. In addition, these animals have abnormal um, blood within their lymphatic vasculature um, that's associated with hemorrhaging and the, the ability of the, the lymphatics to take up these um, pathological hemorrhagic blood cells within the lymphatics. If we look at the skin um, and the developing dermal lymphatics of these animals in comparison to wild type, where you have this beautiful branching network of large patent vessels that are uh, doing their job of draining interstitial fluid, you'll notice that the GPRC5B null lymphatics are thin and spindly and really um, you know, seem to lack those appropriate connections and there's a lot of uh, blind ends uh, within this lymphatic vasculature within the skin. So clearly, uh, the absence of GPRC5B is associated with, uh, with um, deficits in the, the development of lymphatic vessels in embryogenesis. Now, if we allow these mice to be born, and, and we did here, you can immediately notice that GPRC5B null mice um, are growth restricted. And incidentally, this has been reported by other groups who've made a, a independent lines of GPRC5B uh, null mice, but it hasn't been rigorously quantitated or, or evaluated in this way. So here's a postnatal day seven uh, pup that is clearly much smaller than its litter mate. And even at postnatal day 21, these animals fail to thrive. Eventually, 20% of these animals die by weaning, shown here in the pie charts, and they really are sickly and, and don't do well. And I'll hearken back to the well-established role of lymphatics in the intestine for nutrient absorption. And so although we're still studying this now, it certainly remains plausible that a deficit of GPRC5B within the small intestine could be associated with poor nutrient absorption and lipid absorption leading to this growth restriction. Uh, we don't know that for sure yet, but that would be a, a, a certain possibility to explore further. Looking at the heart of these animals, the, the lymphatics of the myocardium develop postnatally in the postnatal period. And in the wild type animal, and you can zoom in here, you can start to appreciate this beautiful branching pattern that emanates just under the atria of the developing lymphatics and on top of the myocardium. But in the GPRC5B null animals, they are growth restricted, as you can see in the size of the heart here um, and in this sample. But you can also see that there is this marked deficit in the branching and surface coverage of um, lymphatics in the GPRC null mice that are growth restricted. Those animals that didn't have growth restriction, however, appear to have normal development of uh, their cardiac lymphatics, and maybe they um, eventually can develop normal lymphatics, which is what enables them to survive. And again, about 80% of the mice do survive uh, into old age. So then to mechanistically look at the, uh, the role and function of GPRC5B in lymphatic endothelial cells, we turned to an in vitro culture system where we were able to knock down the expression of GPRC5B using two um, different sRNA constructs. And I hope you can appreciate right away by the, the red dots and circles that absence of GPRC5B is associated with a uh, market attenuation and the continued proliferation and viability of these lymphatic endothelial cells. And this is important because it tells us that cell autonomously, uh, independent of external growth factors or potential ligands, the expression of GPRC5B within the lymphatic endothelium is required for the maintenance and viability of these cells, um, independent of, of its uh, native environment. And so that's uh, the, the summary of our findings on GPRC5B and GPR116. Um, ultimately, of course, we would love to identify 
what the ligands are for these receptors. And we've proposed uh, some studies to look at lymph as a, as a potential candidate uh, biological fluid that, that would make sense, of course, um, to have uh, uh, potential ligands for these receptors. Um, and we're moving forward again with, with additional um, reporter lines and, and uh, gene-specific uh, knockout lines. And so in, in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge Chef Bong Quan, who was responsible for those elegant zebrafish studies and a very talented postdoc, Wen Jing Xu. Uh, Hyuk Bum is right here, and Wen Jing is here. Um, Wen Jing, with um, help from Nate Nelson Manny, an MD PhD student in the lab, spearheaded these studies. And of course, we're, none of this could have happened without the generous funding of NCATS and the RO3 that supported this work. So thanks for your attention, and I look forward to questions in the discussion. But one uh, G protein couple receptor we've been studying. And uh, just to uh, uh, start with uh, uh, the human element here. So this is our group. And this um, Sean Austin and Jason, uh, the uh, major people in the lab uh, who contributed uh, to our work. And this, like the whole team. Um, so basically we are interested uh, in metabolic uh, regulation in two aspects, glucose metabolism and body weight. Uh, maintenance. So body weight is maintained by homeostatic mechanisms and determined by the balance of caloric intake and energy expenditure, as you can see here in this um, seesaw model, when uh, total caloric, caloric int intake exceeds energy expenditure, body weight goes up. Um, so obesity results from a long-term positive energy imbalance. Um, in modern societies, excessive food intake and a sedentary lifestyle uh, undoubtedly have contributed to the increasing obesity uh, prevalence nowadays. Uh, we're also interested in glucose homeostasis. Uh, glucose homeostasis is achieved by the coordinated actions of multiple organs shown here, pancreas, uh, gut, intestine, um, brain, liver, muscle, and fat. Uh, um, Hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia uh, can be both detrimental to human health. Uh, in uh, diabetes setting, insulin resistance and beta cell function contribute to impaired glucose homeostasis, uh, which may manifest as defective postprandial glucose disposal and insufficient insulin secretion. Um, so basically we are inter interested in the endocrine regulation of energy balance and uh, glucose metabolism. So uh, for example, you can see here in the peripheral tissues, leptin, uh, gut peptide, including GLP-1, GIP, PYY, CCK, uh, they are produced and then they can relay the hormonal information to the central nervous system as, as well as through the neural mechanisms, uh, for example, the vagus nerve, sympathetic, parasympathetic, uh, and also enteric nerve system is uh, important to signal. Um, these uh, hormonal and uh, neural mechanisms together coordinate uh, the regulation on food intake and uh, glucose metabolism. So we are interested in understanding the nutritional and the hormonal cues and also how the um, brain and the peripheral tissues orchestrated together to regulate the homeostatic uh, mechanism, uh, homeostasis. Um, a lot of the hormone receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. Uh, for example, GLP receptor, uh, ghrelin receptor, uh, and other uh, gut hormone receptors. And that's why we're interested in the G-protein coupled receptors in this aspect. And uh, um, also more studies reviewed the intricate uh, neural network uh, within the hypothalamus and also a uh, key uh, chemical identities of the hypothalamic neurons have been uh, identified. Um, as I mentioned, we're interested in the G-protein coupled receptors and also uh, two organs of particular interests uh, include uh, the brain and the gut and uh, the um, key end endpoints we are interested in uh, include glucose metabolism and uh, feeding regulation. So in our lab, we use uh, basically both in vivo approaches, including transgenic mouse models, 
and also in vitro approaches, in, including uh, cellular signaling studies and organoid models to um, understand the physiological function of G protein coupled receptors and hope to understand uh, how they can be, um, uh, how the defective G protein coupled receptor function can be related to human diseases and whether we can find a cure um, based on that. Um, in my opinion, there are three elements in metabolic regulation, including genetics, diet, and aging. And we have been uh, uh, and incorporating these elements in our studies. Um, there are three vignettes. And the first one is today's talk, uh, which is the endocrine mechanisms of GPCR signaling in the context of diet and aging. Um, this is a brief outline. So I'm just going to give a quick very quick introduction about how we identify the GPR-17 pathway as a potential target for metabolic regulation and how we analyzed the endocrine function, um, neuroendocrine function of GPR-17 uh, in the hypothalamic neurons, AGRP and POMC. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the last two uh, um, parts. For example, how we analyzed the enteroendocrine function of GPR-17 and also um, how we analyzed the human GPR-17 genetic variants. Um, there are, for example, uh, two key hypothalamic neuronal populations regulating uh, feeding, uh, namely AGRP neurons and POMC neurons. You can see uh, both neuron types uh, express insulin receptor and leptin receptor. They also secrete neuropeptides, including AGRP, MPY, and uh, alpha MSH. So uh, these two neuronal populations will uh, regulate feeding and also energy expenditure. They're, uh, they sort of like antagonizing each other. We started the project actually from a transcription factor, uh, FOXO1, which is uh, evolutionarily conserved transcription factor that regulates metabolism by responding to hormonal cues. And we found uh, insulin, both insulin and leptin signaling inactivates FOXO1 by excluding it from the nucleus. Um, so we start from FOXO1 and uh, we hypothesized that maybe removing FOXO1 will both sensitize uh, insulin and leptin signaling pathways and bring beneficial metabolic results. And indeed, we went ahead and knocked out the FOXO1 in AGRP neurons um, and then characterized the metabolic phenotype of the uh, FOXO1 knockout mouse. And to our uh, consistent with our expectation, when we remove FOXO1 um, in the AGRP neurons from the mouse, we see um, a beneficial metabolic phenotype, including a linear phenotype reduced feeding and uh, um, uh, increased uh, brain sensitivity to hormones and nutrients. Um, we also, uh, but FOXO1 is a transcription uh, factor. Back then, uh, it was difficult to, uh, to use it as a drug target. So we went downstream to identify what are the targeted genes of FOXO1. And then I did uh, microarray analysis by collecting FOXO1 uh, multiple and a knockout AGRP neurons from the mice. And uh, in these knockout neurons, I see one uh, gene that topped the list, which is GPR17. Its expression is drastically downregulated. Um, and late, several years later, um, a group in Europe also find a consistent finding. Um, GPR-17 to be the target of FOXO1 family. So from there, I started to characterize the metabolic function of GPR-17. And here I'm going to show you a couple of examples of GPR-17 as a neurohormonal um, connection. So I generated a GPR-17 uh, conditional animals and also uh, crossed the mice to generate AGRP neuron specific GPR17 knockouts. As you can see here, when I knock out the GPR17 in AGRP neurons, the mice became leaner. 
Um, and also okay. they have um, less food intake during the dark cycle when the uh, rodents are most actively engaged in feeding. And moreover, I characterized uh, their energy expenditure profile and I found uh, GPR, uh, AGRP neuron specific GPR-17 not mice. Uh, they are less energy efficient and uh, they spend relatively more energy per activity count here. Um, they also have increased satiety. During the fasting refeeding challenge, uh, they have less food foraging behavior during fasting phase. And when food was given back, uh, the animal, the knockout animals um, have less uh, hyper, uh, less rebound hyperphagia. Um, but back to the uh, AGRP neurons and POMC neurons, uh, where we started the story, um, how, uh, whether knocking out AGRP, uh, GPR-17 AGRP neurons is going to affect the neuronal activity and how this is uh, maybe perhaps this is the underlying cause of the changed satiety. Um, as you can see here, um, when we uh, fast the animals, uh, we see uh, GPR-17 knockout animals have less AGRP neuron activation uh, consistent with the um, increase of satiety during fasting refeeding. And also after refeeding, uh, we saw the animals have more CFOS staining in the arcuate nucleus. However, um, we don't know whether those are POMC neurons or not. In order to uh, quantify that, I did a double labeling um, by using a uh, beta endorphin as POMC uh, neuron marker. And I, here I see the quantified result on the right uh, in the knockout animals uh, during refeeding. Uh, a lot of the POMC neurons became activated. So in the end, um, when we remove GPR-17 from the AGRP neurons, uh, I see the mouse have, um, um, they are less responsive to fasting and they have increased satiety during refeeding. Okay, so um, my computer is acting up slowly. Uh, I'm just going to skip that slide and telling you um, about our, uh, my student, uh, Austin Riley. Uh, he continued the, the line of research and characterized the, the function of GPR-17 in POMC neurons by generating POMC-specific GPR-17 knockouts. And here, uh, POMC neuron is only a small fraction of all the hypothalamic uh, cells, so we see a fan fan here, but nevertheless, when we sort out the POMC neurons, you can see in the knockout animals, it's completely uh, ablated. Um, and this is a quantified result. Um, but uh, to our disappointment on child, normal child diet, uh, both female and male animals are quite lean and there's virtually no difference between wild type and a knockout and more detailed characterization, still no change at all. Um, until we pushed the boundaries to characterize their phenotype on high fat diet. On high fat diet, we start to see a sexual dimorphism between female and male. In the female mice, uh, we see the knockout animals are better protected uh, from the high fat diet um, feeding. And as you can see here on the right in female animals, uh, high fat diet induced body weight gain in the wild type animals in panel H, but the knockout animals gained significant less weight. And also um, their fat pad and fat mass is lower. Um, the reasons behind that, uh, we think there are two reasons behind this phenotype. First, when we remove GPR-17 in POMC neurons, we see um, uh, increased POMC processing. And for example, the um, beta endorphin levels is 
uh, significantly high, especially in the females, and alpha MSH is higher in the knockout females. It's consistent with, with what we had expected before. And also POMC neurons, as they activate, it can in, uh, increase the satiety of the animals. And uh, um, um, as you can see here, uh, the POMC, uh, when we remove GPR-17 from the POMC neurons, we do see uh, increased action potentials, indicating more POMC neuron uh, activity. The resting membrane potential trends up. Um, also, uh, they, uh, this is a recording of the baseline recording. Um, the red one is the knockout POMC neuron. As you can see here, they have more action potential, um, but these neurons are normal because when we inject a current in these uh, neurons, they can fire uh, similar as the wall type. Um, so we have, um, uh, now I move on to a different chapter, the, the gut GPR-17 um, data. So this uh, work was uh, published earlier this year and as we were working in the brain, we actually found out that GPR-17 uh, was also expressed in the intestinal tissues. And here we characterize the human samples. Um, as you can see from the staining, GPR-17 is stained in red here. And the uh, uh, endocrine marker chromogranin A was stained in green. And uh, we can see a good overlapping of these. And also uh, we stained GPR-17 with other gut hormones. Um, as you can see here, GLP-1 is demonstrated on the left and the GIP is demonstrated on the right. Curiously, GPR-17 expression have a good overlapping with GLP-1 here, uh, but not so much with GIP. So this prompted us to, uh, to think whether uh, GPR-17 could play a function in the enteroendocrine cells in the intestine. And these cells secrete uh, gut hormones, including incretin, that can uh, improve glucose metabolism. So uh, uh, we generated the uh, gut GPR-17 knockout mice using willing free ERT, which is inducible. Uh, so uh, we induced the knockout in adult mice to, so that we don't have any developmental uh, effect carry on. Um, so this is a confirmation of the knockout. Um, it's virtually gone in the intestine. But uh, the morphology of the whole intestine was okay. Uh, basically, we did a careful characterization. We were not able to find any morphological or histological differences um, for the knockout and uh, knockout gut. Um, and we uh, painstakingly characterized the, the microbiome composition of GPR-17 uh, in GPR-17 intestinal knockouts. Again, we didn't find any statistical uh, different result. Um, because incretins uh, function to promote insulin secretion from the gut, uh, one way is through the GLP-1 receptor in the pancreatic islet. Um, we also characterized if the pancreatic islet in these knockout animals were normal or not. Uh, we quantified the result and showed it didn't affect the islet mass or function. Um, but how about their glucose phenotype? So uh, we did oral glucose tolerance test in both female and uh, male mice. Uh, the female ac mice actually showed a better improvement during oral glucose tolerance test. And uh, this knockout effect were, uh, have been persistent even one year after uh, the induced knockout. And the older females actually showed a better uh, glucose tolerance test. And moreover, uh, we measure the hormones during the glucose tolerance um, test. For example, we measured oral glucose-stimulated insulin secretion uh, 
and the hormone secretion in both male animals shown on the upper level and the female animals shown at the um, bottom. So in both cases, we see um, increased insulin secretion after the oral glucose gavage and also uh, increased um, um, GLP-1 um, gut hormone secretion after oral um, glucose or corn oil gavage in the knockout animals. Um, but in the animals, it can be complicated. Uh, so we singled out uh, the gut organoid and generated the GPR-17 wild type and the knockout gut organoid. As you can see here, it's knocked out. Um, and then uh, we repeated the experiment to see how uh, the GPR-17 now gut organoids may respond to the nutritional cues, including uh, fatty acid, uh, glucose, uh, um, bile acid receptor. And in, uh, all, in virtually all cases, we see actually uh, increased GLP-1 secretion, both under the baseline level, but also uh, with the nutrient, nutrition, nutrient stimulation here. Um, we also measured a GIP in parallel, which is a gut hormone secreted by another enteroendocrine cell in the gut. Um, it showed minimal expression overlapping with GPR-17. And in this case, we also didn't see much change about GIP either. So based on this, we hypothesized that GPR-17 can be a brick um, to inhibit GLP-1 secretion um, in the gut. Um, after we knock out the GPR-17 in the gut, it removes this uh, brick. So more um, incretin in GLP-1 can be released um, after glucose um, or uh, nutrient ingestion. So it benefits the glucose homeostasis overall. And we also characterized uh, the, uh, the molecular mechanisms. We measured the calcium uh, response uh, as well as um, the cyclic AMP response. Um, basically, we summarized uh, the uh, result here. Um, if you're interested, you can uh, see the article or talk to me. Um, um, I think I'm running out of time. Just uh, uh, a quick uh, couple of slides to tell you, we also analyzed human GPR-17 non-synonymous uh, genetic variants in um, human healthy and uh, metabolic uh, disease populations here. Uh, we analyzed the genetic variants. They did not affect uh, protein expression or subcellular localization. However, they did uh, affect the downstream signaling pathways. Um, in particular, three human genetic uh, mutants. And here is a summarized uh, result. These mutants, including D15N, V96M, and the G136S. Uh, the uh, uh, crystal structure of GPR-17 is not available. So we did a homology modeling and reviewed the potential mechanisms of how, why these genetic variants can contribute uh, to the altered signaling outcome. Um, that's the acknowledgement. Uh, thank you.